Alrighty. Well, as we turn to the word preached, let's ask for God's blessing upon it. Father God, we do praise you and thank you and adore you uh, for giving us, as always, this great privilege and honor and blessing to be able to come together this Lord's Day as a church, uh, as those whom you have redeemed by your blood, the blood of Christ. We thank you for giving us this privilege. We thank you for being able to come and to confess our sins and to receive the assurance of pardon from your word. We thank you for being able to learn from your word and to be taught it and to be uh, uh, exhorted with it. We thank you for being able to sing these praises unto you uh, and to the glory of your name. Lord, we thank you for all that we're able to do, for the fellowship that we're able to have. And uh, Lord, we, we honor you. We thank you for these bountiful blessings. And we ask, Lord, that as we now uh, specifically look at your word from the book of Jonah, that you would continue to instruct us and edify us and help us to, to see not only what to believe, but then what to do and even how to feel. And that uh, through this, you would continue to uh, ever increasingly sanctify us so as to make us holy in your sight and pleasing in your sight. And Lord, we know that this is a gift that you must bestow to us as individuals, as families, as a congregation. And so we ask for that blessing now to rest upon every single one of us. And we come with great hope and confidence because we're coming in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, as it says up here on the slide, we are going to be looking at Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 for today. And so, if you have your Bibles and you open them up to the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 is going to be our passage today. And while some of you are doing that, uh, you will note that this is ultimately going to bring us to the very end of the book itself. And so we're already finishing our walkthrough of Jonah, and so it hasn't actually taken us all that long. We started it just back in the uh, beginning of December, so it's been just a couple of weeks that we've been working through it. And uh, we're going to be officially finishing our walkthrough today. And with that said, we will then also, Lord willing, take next week to do one final synopsis, uh, overview, look at the entire book, and to make some final observations in light of all of it, and some final applications as well. Uh, but today we're going to be looking at the last chapter of the book itself. And so, like usual, allow me to just briefly recap a little bit of what we have seen thus far up to this point. So, uh, back in chapter 1, at the beginning of the book, we saw that the prophet Jonah uh, was commanded by God to go to the Gentile city of Nineveh, which was the uh, capital of the Assyrian Empire, some 500 plus miles away from Israel, She's commanded to go there and to preach against it because Nineveh's evil had risen up to God. And then, instead of obeying the voice of the Lord, Jonah goes the exact opposite direction, goes to the port city of Joppa, gets on a ship, and then sails even further west to the city of Tarshish, uh, so as to go, again, literally the exact opposite of the way that God has commanded him to go. Now, in the process of trying to sail away... The Lord then sends a mighty storm upon the seas uh, to such a degree that the ship is just completely overwhelmed by the storm, can't get anywhere. The sailors and the crewmen uh, can't do anything to, to right the ship, they can't get anywhere. And so then, ultimately, between the conversations with the crewmen and Jonah himself, uh, they discover that the Lord has sent the storm because Jonah is running away from his command. And so Jonah informs them that the only way to calm this storm is to throw him overboard, which they were reluctant to do initially, but they ultimately do that. And once they throw him out, the storm does in fact cease. Now, once Jonah was then there in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea just floating there, God appointed a great fish, a uh, sea creature of some sort, to come up and swallow Jonah, and then Jonah spent the next three days and three nights inside the belly of the great fish. And from there, he prays unto the Lord for help and for mercy and in repentance for having fled from the Lord. At which point, the Lord does have mercy on him and has the fish then spit him back out. And so once Jonah is now back on the land, he then is recommissioned by the Lord to go to Nineveh and to preach against it the message that God gives. At which point, Jonah obeys the second time. And he makes his way to Nineveh and preaches against it the message that God gave, which was in chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, basically, it was very short, very to the point. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So it's a message of coming judgment, uh, repent or else. 
And amazingly, God has incredible mercy upon the city of Nineveh, such that it tells us it, virtually everybody repents, from the greatest to the least, the animals, uh, the king himself, they're all wearing sackcloth, they're all fasting, they're all crying out to the Lord, they're all sitting in dust and ashes, they all wholesale repent mightily, they turn from their wickedness, and thus in chapter 3 verse 10 it tells us that when God saw that uh, what they did and how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So God spares the city. Which then brings us to our text for today in chapter 4. And so if you please rise as we read our passage for this morning. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 is our passage. This is the word of the Lord. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plants. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plants? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plants, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Thus ends the reading of God's word. May he write it on our hearts by faith. And you may be seated. All right, so that is the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking now at for this morning. And as we were already saying prior to reading it, uh, this concludes the uh, whole book of Jonah itself, brings us right up to the end, and in it, uh, it is ultimately, like usual, continuing the overall narrative of where we left off last week, where we just saw in the uh, recap that God ultimately relents of the disaster that he was going to send against Nineveh because they repented, and so now, in today's passage, we see ultimately how Jonah responds to the fact that God has just relented, and then not only that, but then we also get God's response to Jonah's response. And that brings us right to the end of the book. So basically, it's Jonah's response, and then how does God respond to what Jonah is doing, and then what can we learn from that? So, therefore, like usual, we're going to jump right into it and begin to work through the text itself a little bit slower and unpack it as we go, and then we will make some applications to our life today. And so, we're going to look once again, if you turn your attention to the first paragraph, as it is in the ESV translation, uh, verses 1 through 4, this is how it began. It said, that, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Alright, so here now, again, as we were just saying prior to reading that, uh, we get Jonah's initial response to the fact that Nineveh has just been spared. And we see his response is not a good one, such that it says that he was displeased, uh, exceedingly displeased, and very, very angry at this turn of events. 
Uh, to which we can then naturally ask, uh, so why was Jonah so upset uh, at the fact that they just repented of their evil? Because really this is like the, this is the, the hope and desire of every preacher everywhere, every minister everywhere, every Christian everywhere, that when they were to share the word of God with them, that there would be heartfelt, genuine repentance on the part of the people whom they're ministering to. Right? That's what everybody desires to happen, and now it's happened uh, wholesale for the entire city, from the least to the greatest, even the rulers of the city, they've all repented, so this is absolutely glorious, and yet Jonah is exceedingly displeased at this turn of events, and so we can then ask the question as to why in the world would this possibly upset Jonah? Now, we've actually answered that question um, a handful of times in our walkthrough of this book already. And so for some of us, uh, everything I'm about to share is going to be review. Um, but repetition is our friend in preaching. And so we, we review a lot of things uh, for the sake of remembering. Um, but basically, when we ask, so why does this upset Jonah? Uh, a, a common thing that will often be stated is simply the idea that, uh, you know, Jonah in his heart was primarily just a racist. That he just hated Gentiles, he hated Ninevite Gentiles in particular, and so when he sees that good things are happening to them, then he's just filled with rage and discontentment. Right? So that's, that's a common thing that people will sometimes say, and we have conceded to the fact that it's probably true that Jonah didn't have a ton of affection for the Ninevites, because they were a, an enemy nation, they were a particularly evil people, and so it's probably true that he didn't really care for them. However, we have argued that there's perhaps a, something a little bit uh, more to this than what initially meets the eye as far as just a pure, just simple hatred of Ninevites in general. And that is, Jonah, as a prophet of the Lord, uh, would have therefore been well acquainted with the scriptures and the law of God, and uh, therefore he would have known about Deuteronomy 32.21 which is a passage where God warns the Israelites that if they go after that which is no God, then God will go after that which is no nation. Right? This is a warning. So if you commit idolatry, Israel, then the Lord will judge you and then turn his affections for a while to another nation. And so Jonah is able to understand this and see the writing on the wall that Israel in his day was in the grip of idolatry. They were forsaking the Lord, they were committing apostasy, and so now when he is commanded to go to a Gentile nation and to preach against them, and he says he knows that God is going to be gracious and merciful to them, in fact it says he knows that God is going to show his steadfast love to Nineveh, and that word steadfast love in Hebrew is actually the, the word chesed, the guttural chesed, and, uh, and it means God's covenant love and faithfulness. It's like God's special covenant, faithfulness, steadfast love that he shows to his covenant people. This is the special love for covenant people, and now he's showing this covenant love to Gentiles, and not he's going to remove it from Israel and show it to Gentiles for a time. And so again, he recognizes that this is basically the, the sign per Deuteronomy 32, 21, that uh, God is going to judge Israel and, and bless another nation for a time. And so it's that reason, we've argued, that is ultimately stirring Jonah's discomfort and displeasure at this moment. That ultimately was stirred on by his love for Israel. He loves his home country. This is the nation that he's been ministering to his whole life. He doesn't want to see them get judged and, and I, or, you know, ruined in some capacity. And so because of that, uh, he is very displeased at the sign that this is now going to happen soon based on the fact that they've repented. And so he's very, very displeased. Now, with that said, even if this is the ultimate reason, which we've argued it is, uh, even if it sounds a bit more noble to say that it was for the love of Israel and not necessarily just for the pure hatred of the Ninevites, uh, the text also makes it quite plain that Jonah is nevertheless wrong in his thinking at this point. Like, he's got a wrong mindset uh, at this time, or even being upset, such that the Lord chides him here in verse 4, Do you do well to be angry? And it doesn't actually answer it immediately here, but the presupposed answer is no. That Jonah is actually wrong for being upset at this moment. And uh, this is even further highlighted uh, with a sort of play on words that is used here in the text, which is uh, perhaps not as clear in a lot of our English translations, but is perhaps more clear in, or it is more clear in the Hebrew text. And what I mean is, 
when it says that uh, Jonah was displeased at this time, the Hebrew word that's being used there is ra'ah, which means to be evil or bad. Okay? And the word that's interestingly translated as exceedingly is a very similar word, ra, which also means evil or bad. And so a bit more of a literal translation would be that this was very evil to Jonah, greatly evil, and he was angry. So Jonah considers this to be a great evil. And this is kind of a play on words because the word, particularly for Ra, has been the word that's been used frequently throughout the entire book. So back in chapter 1, verse 2, when it says that Nineveh's evil had come up to the Lord, it uses the word Ra. Their evil came up to him. Uh, then in chapter 3, verse 8, when it says that the Ninevites turned from their evil, it uses the word Ra. And then if you're looking, I don't have it on the slide, but if you look in your Bibles in chapter 3, verse 10, in the ESV it says that God relented and turned away from the disaster that he was going to do to them. And that word for disaster is also the word Ra, actually, that God turned away from the evil that he was going to do to them and, and destroy them. And so basically put all that together and it says that Nineveh was very evil, and then they turned from their evil, and therefore God relented of the evil that he was going to do to them. And then Jonah sees it, and he considers all of this to be very, very evil. Like, he does not like this at all. Which again is highlighting the fact that Jonah is not thinking right. He's taking the fact that they've just turned from their evil, and he's considering this to be an evil thing. Right? So again, he's just completely upside down in his thinking, but that's where he's at at this point. Which brings us to verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. All right, so here now, in the next sequence of events for Jonah, uh, we actually get uh, indications, once again, uh, that Jonah's overall attitude is just simply not good and it's not where it should be. Uh, first, we're told that he goes out to the east side of the city, which on the surface of it looks like it's just a simple description of the fact that he goes to the east side and hangs out there, which it is, I mean, that is in a sense, he literally went to the east side of the city, that's what it's telling us, uh, however, that phrase itself, to the east side of the city, is also very likely uh, designed to recall the reader's mind to the various other times throughout scripture, this common pattern that we actually see uh, to describe a time of exile or even a time of uh, going further away from the presence of God. And oftentimes when that is displayed, it's described in these terms of going further east, interestingly, in Scripture. So in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, uh, they were driven to the east. And then God put a cherubim angel on the east side to guard it so that they would not come back in. And then when Cain killed his brother Abel, uh, he was banished further east after that. And then when they went to go build the Tower of Babel, it says they went further east and then built it in the plain of Shinar. And then even when they would make various sacrifices uh, in the portions that were not to be sacrificed and they were displeasing the Lord, they were to throw it on the east side of the altar. And so this idea, this is common pattern of the, first, like the things that are displeasing to the Lord, of things when you get further away from the Lord's presence, it's this description of going further east. Uh, and so even the, the, the Garden of Eden, as we said, like the entrance was on the east side. So even just in a kind of physical sense, you, go to the, you had to go to the east side, but then to go in to the presence of the Lord, you had to go west. If you kept going east, you'd go further away. And then they, when they constructed the temple and the tabernacle, they did it almost uh, certainly to mirror the Garden of Eden, that the entrance was on the east side. So you had to go to the east side, and then if you wanted to go into the presence of the Lord, you had to go actually west. If you kept going east, then you would be going further away from the Lord. And so all that to say, this is uh, very likely an allusion to that very fact, that when he's going to the east side of the city, this is just a, an indi a subtle indication that he's going further away from God's presence in his thinking at this point. And as he does, it says he makes a booth there, and while in the booth, he's just basically looking out over the city, he's got a good view, and he's waiting to see what is going to become of the city. And now we've already seen at the beginning of the chapter that he sees that they've repented wholesale. He knows that God has now shown his grace, mercy, and steadfast love to them, which has already made him angry. So he already knows that 
the city's going to be spared. That's already implied. Uh, however, it seems the indication that when he comes out to see what's going to become of the city, it has this idea that he still is holding out hope, perhaps, that God will relent of his relenting and will actually destroy the city after all. Like, this seems to be the indication that he wants the city to actually still be destroyed, and so he's just kind of seeing if that's going to, in fact, happen. Now, as he's waiting for all of this, another little bit of irony that is happening here in these verses uh, is that when it says that he's made himself a booth to hang out in, uh, that word for booth is the same word that's used to describe the booths that the uh, Israelites would make during the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, as it, as it is sometimes called. And this was a celebration, a week-long celebration, major celebration in Israel, uh, that was always done in the seventh month, which usually landed in September or October uh, in the calendar, calendar. And it was after the harvest time, and the Israelites, for an entire week, they would construct these makeshift booths, or like little uh, shelters, and then they would live inside it for an entire week, uh, and this was in part in remembrance of the wilderness wandering generation, who likewise had to live in booths, and they did not have any permanent dwelling. So it was a remembrance back to that. Um, but also because it took place after the harvest and after all the gathering of all the food, uh, this celebration itself became uh, also a uh, hopeful expectation of the time when God would bring all the nations to himself. So it was a look back to remember God's past faithfulness, and then it was a time to look forward to God's future faithfulness when God brings the nations to the Lord. And to kind of even highlight this further, in Genesis chapter 10, uh, we get what is sometimes referred to as the table of nations, uh, meaning we get the descendant list of all the names after Noah and Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And, uh, and in this entire list of names, which is a whole list, it's a genealogy passage or chapter, um, we're told in Genesis 30, uh, 10, 32, that from all of these people came all the nations of the world. Okay, so we're, we get a list of all the nations, and hence it became known as the Table of Nations chapter. And interestingly, there are 70 names that are mentioned, and thus, in this sense, there are 70 nations of the world. And then fascinatingly, just as an interesting observation, that in Numbers 29, during the Feast of Booths, uh, the Israelites were to sacrifice 70 bulls total throughout the entire week, which many commentators believe is an allusion back to the 70 nations of the world, which again is to highlight the idea of this hopeful expectation of how God was going to draw all the nations to himself throughout the course of time in history. And so again, the irony in all of this is that the Feast of Booths was a time to celebrate God's faithfulness in bringing the nations to himself, and now Jonah is sitting in a booth all by himself, and he is very, very upset that God is drawing this nation to himself, which again is all to highlight that Jonah is simply completely backwards in his thinking right now. He's just got a bad attitude. And again, God has chided him, do you do well to be angry like this? Again, with the implication being, no, Jonah is wrong at this point. That brings us to verse 6 through 8. It says, Now the Lord appointed a plant, and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plants. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plants, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that it, he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Okay, so, while Jonah is hanging out in his booth, waiting to see what's going to become of the city, we have an interesting sequence of events here where it tells us that God ends up uh, having or appointing this plant to grow up. As we'll see uh, in, in a couple verses, it grew up in a night, and then it will ultimately perish in a night, as we'll see. So this plant, I mean, I don't know if Jonah could actually see it growing, but it's growing very fast, and it ultimately grows up so as to be a shade for Jonah to save him from his discomfort. So ultimately, we don't even, I guess, know what happened to his booth at this point because the booth had been serving that function in some capacity. But now the implication is that the primary uh, shelter that he has is this great big plant that God has grown up very quickly so as to save him from the uncomfortable nature of where he's hanging out. And because of this, Jonah becomes exceedingly glad. He's very, very happy for the plant that is now providing him shade. But then, 
It says, the very next day, God appoints a worm. Notice it's the exact same phrase. God appointed the plant to, uh, to save him from his discomfort, but now God appoints a worm to attack that plant so that it withers. And then, God's not done, he appoints a scorching east wind to come and blow across the land, and he then has the sun beat down hard on the head of Jonah so as to make him faint, and he's now so unbearably uncomfortable that he literally wants to die at this point. Like, he's so uh, unbearably, like, being plastered by the, the sun and the hot wind that he wants to die. And so that's the sequence of events that happens, to which we can then ask, so what is all of this like, what's God doing in all of this? Why is all of this happening at this point? And uh, the first thing that we will simply note, as uh, just a sort of very clear observation, is that all of this is uh, clearly highlighting the absolute sovereignty of God over absolutely everything in the universe, which has actually been a, a theme that is on high display throughout the entire book already. Uh, we have seen that it is God who is the one who brings the storm, and then God's the one who tells the storm when to stop. Uh, he tells great fishes when to go and swallow prophets, and he tells them when to spit those prophets back out. He commands plants to grow up in a single day to provide shade for prophets, and then he commands the worm, now go eat that plant so that it withers, and then the worm obeys it. And then he commands the wind, now blow across that land, and it obeys. And he commands the sun, now beat down on the head of that prophet, and it obeys. And so every aspect of creation does the bidding of God. Absolutely everything is under his sovereignty. He ordains all things that come to pass. And so the very idea of natural law, as we kind of understand it today, that there are just natural laws that just, they always happen. The sun always rises, you know, in certain fashions, and it always sets. And we just kind of think it happens naturally. It just happens. Uh, but the reality is God is sustaining every single thing that is happening in the universe. Like the sun rise, rose again this morning because God actively made it rise once again. And it will set this evening because God will sovereignly make it set yet again this evening. And the, the, the cold that we're experiencing right now is because God has said, now, you know, this particular region, you're going to be in the negative temps for this amount of time. And it's because God is ordaining all of this to happen this way. Right? So we see that very clearly in this passage. Everything does the bidding of God in the universe. Right? But that still then begs the question as to why is God doing this? Right? Because it's very clear God's the one doing it. He appointed it, he appointed it, he appointed it. Uh, but then we ask, so why is God appointing a plant to specifically you know, protect him from his discomfort? And then the very next day he says, now I'm going to take it all away. Right? So in the words of Job, he would say, the Lord has given it, the Lord has taken it away. Why does he do this on occasion? Well, the answer to that is actually a bit more fleshed out in the next three verses, which brings us up to the end of the book, which says, uh, verse 9, But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? The end. That's so how the whole book comes to an end on that note. And we never do get Jonah's response after this, uh, but that's just, that's just where the book just decides to come to a close. And uh, from it, though, before it comes to a close, we see this brief little uh, exchange between God and the Lord. And in it, we get a little bit more insight as to what God is doing with the plant and the, the worm and the wind and the sun. And that is, basically, uh, he is using all of these things as a, a lesson, basically, as a physical object lesson to correct uh, the, the wrong thinking. Basically, to expose Jonah's misplaced sympathy in this whole sequence of events. Uh, Jonah was very mad about the destruction of a plant, but not mad about the destruction, or the potential destruction, of an entire city. Right? So, he's, he, so he's got this misplaced sympathy. He had a lot of sympathy for a plant, but not for an entire city filled with people. And so God says, you pitied the plant. You didn't do anything to make it grow, right? It's just I, just, I made it grow for you, and yet you're very, very angry that it's now been taken away, that it's been destroyed, and he says, therefore should not I pity Nineveh. 
which is a great city. It's filled with 120,000 persons and also much cattle. Which again, it's interesting that he includes the animals in this. He says it's got lots of people, lots of animals, and you really didn't give a rip about them at all. You wanted them to be destroyed, but when I produce a plant, which is you know lower on the hierarchy scale than humans and animals even, though they're part of God's creation, he likes plants too, but if they're lower than the, the people and the animals, and he says, and yet you were very concerned about that. So your overall understanding of things was just, again, on its head. You have the sympathy for the wrong things, ultimately, in this scenario. Okay? Uh, Jonah basically should have treated the city like he did the plants. Uh, he should have uh, mourned over its potential destruction. And uh, when it was spared, he should have been exceedingly glad that it was spared. Uh, as he also, the Lord makes note here, uh, the city itself had 120,000 peoples who did not know their right hand from their left. Which some uh, understand it to be a reference to potential children, that the city was also filled with children who they didn't know any things really. Uh, or it could be just a general reference to the fact that they were a people who did not have God's revealed law and word, and so they just, they really didn't have the instructions or the commands of God to do what they're supposed to do. So either case, again, the point is, uh, Jonah's sympathies were misplaced. And now God is using all of this to, like, physically show him that he was in the wrong. Okay? So that's it's basically a lesson that he's being taught. And there's actually, I would argue, a little bit, uh, a few other things that are actually being highlighted in this. Um, but we're actually going to save those observations for next week when we do the one final overview of the whole book as a whole, right? Uh, but that's just a little teaser for then. But for now, having, again, brought us up to the, uh, the last verse of the book, we can therefore summarize and then apply. So basically what is happening in this chapter, we see that after God had shown mercy to Nineveh, does not destroy it, uh, Jonah was exceedingly upset about this, verses 1 through 4. Very, very uh, angry because he understood this was a sign that uh, Israel would be judged soon. So it says he goes to the east side of the river where he is then shaded by a plant, uh, verses 5 through 6. And going east again is this indication that he's going further away from the Lord. And uh, then, uh, even though after he was shaded by the plant, uh, God then appoints a worm to come and eat it. And then the wind to come and scorch it. And this makes Jonah very uncomfortable, and then he gets very, very angry, as we see in verses 7 through 8. And in light of that little uh, exchange that happens, God ultimately informs Jonah that the same grief that he felt over the loss of the plant should have been the way he feels about the potential loss of the city, verses 9 through 11. Right? So that's what we see happening here in Jonah chapter 4, and that means we can now transition uh, finally into the point of application. So we ask from all of that, uh, so how do we then, today in the 21st century, apply this passage to our lives now? And to do that, what I would like to do is actually hone in a little bit on what God is chiding Jonah for here at the end. Uh, the way he kind of corrects his misplaced thinking. Uh, because as a general rule or a general principle, even when you're reading the Bible throughout the week, uh, if and when you read that God has to correct somebody's thinking or somebody's actions, uh, it would be good for us to then mark what he's correcting and then also likewise avoid the thing that was needing correction and then do what God said you should be doing all along. It's very, very basic and simple there. And so, okay, so what is God chiding Jonah for in this passage? Well, as we said, uh, ultimately he chided Jonah for having more pity on a plant and thus losing his own comfort. Uh, he had more pity on that than the potential loss of thousands of people and thus he was failing to fulfill his true calling as an Israelite. Okay? So this is, I would argue, basically what God is rebuking him for. That he had more pity on the loss of a plant and thus the loss of his own comforts than he did on the potential loss of thousands of people whom, as an Israelite, he was supposed to be ministering to. So from that, the actual application, the way I word it, is as follows, that we then need to beware of caring more about our personal comforts than we do about the actual mission of God itself. As Christians, as the church, we must beware of caring more about our own personal comforts than we do about the mission of God. Now, with that now stated for us, I want to just make one quick actual qualification uh, at the very, very outset, lest there be any potential misunderstandings, and that is to just note that when we say we should be very careful of not caring more about our personal comforts, 
than God's mission. Uh, this is not to then in any way condemn comforts just outright as if they in themselves were bad or wrong or that we really shouldn't have any personal comforts in life at all. Uh, because sometimes this can be a tendency for certain Christian circles and oftentimes with, uh, you know, Christians who have maybe, a, just I don't know how to word it other than maybe like a very tender conscience of like, you know, they, they, they understand that they have many comforts and there can be this tendency to think that I shouldn't have so much. And it's this kind of idea that if I were truly pleasing to the Lord, then I should probably just get rid of everything I have. I should, I should intentionally live in the most minimalistic, uh, humble lifestyle that I can possibly manage. And then that is what God would actually be most pleased with. And if I have personal comforts, then that means I'm probably compromising my convictions somewhere. This, is, this can be a tendency amongst certain Christians. Uh, we've even in church history, we've seen how even some of the early church fathers had this tendency of extreme asceticism, of you need to get rid of everything, and if, once you get rid of everything, then God will be pleased with your life. Right? So this is a tendency that can happen, and I just want to make it very plain that that's not what I'm saying. And so to view personal comforts as if they were bad in themselves, uh, that that's actually more Gnostic than it is Christian. So we don't want to fall into that uh, category. Uh, but then, at the exact same time, making a qualification of that qualification, um, we do need to understand that the Scripture does also often warn us that comforts can become a danger, or they can become a lure in our life, uh, to the point where we can then simply begin to crave the comforts of life more than what God has actually called us to do. And so naturally, that's what basically I'm, I'm warning us against. There is dangers uh, with personal comforts uh, to the point where, if we're not careful, that can become the entire uh, purpose of our life is to just acquire more and more and more possessions, more comforts. And, uh, and when that happens, as we learn in the parable of the soils in Luke 8, 14, uh, these things can come and choke out our, our effectiveness in the Word. Uh, we think about the, the parable of the, um, or not the parable, the, the story of the rich young ruler, uh, how he had many possessions, many comforts, which in themselves was not wrong or bad. Uh, but he proved to ultimately care more about those things than he did about following Jesus. And so that is what I'm warning us to beware of. That possessions and comforts do have a sort of lure to draw us away from the Lord if we're not careful. Okay? So that's what I'm really kind of getting at here. And so bringing all that back again here into then Jonah, we ask, what was Jonah, as a true Israelite, uh, what was Israel's mission to the world? What was, what, why did God create Israel in the first place? And there's many things that God had Israel do throughout history and, and accomplishing his purposes, but at the very founding of Israel, uh, what was his stated purpose? I think it's fascinating that his stated purpose was actually to be a blessing to all the other nations. So, as we actually noted in our walkthrough, in Genesis chapter 10, we read about all the descendants of Noah and how they comprised all the nations of the world. Then, in Genesis chapter 11, we read about how the Tower of Babel and God confused all the different languages and then scattered all the people. So we learned God created all the nations, and then we learned how he gave them all different languages and they're now all scattered all over the place. And in that context, we then read about Genesis chapter 12, where God calls one of the descendants of Shem, in particular, a man by the name of Abram, who would become Abraham. And he said, uh, he made a covenant with them, saying that he's going to make him into a nation to bless all those other nations. Right? So basically, uh, in Genesis 12, 2 to 3, right when Abraham is first called, he says, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless the, uh, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, again, at the very outset, we see contextually that uh, God calls Abraham, right after telling us that he makes all the nations, and he scatters all those nations, and then he says, now Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation, so as to be a blessing to all those other nations. And so this is why Abraham, or this is why Israel was ultimately created, to be a blessing to all the nations. That was their function, that was their role. Now, throughout Israel's history, we see that Israel often fell into two different ditches. On the one hand, they would often just completely forsake the Lord and commit apostasy and thus be a blessing to nobody. 
Uh, or on the other hand, they would keep the law, and they would worship God in accordance with his word, but they had a, an unfortunate tendency to just be very uh, prideful and haughty totty about it, such that they thought that uh, in so doing, they would be blessed, and all of these blessings were strictly just for Israel. Like, we're the chosen people, we're the covenant people, and this is our stuff, and every other nation can just take a walk, you know, they can just leave. We don't, and so instead of actually interceding on their behalf, which is even what Abraham did as the sort of proto-Israel, proto-prophet, we see him uh, in the book of Genesis pleading with the Lord to spare Sodom and Gomorrah, which was a wicked city, but he says, God, please spare them, because that's what Israel was supposed to do, to be a blessing to the nations around them. That's what the prophets were supposed to do. Uh, but instead of Israel doing that, frequently they just kind of, they would do all the stuff, and then they would try to keep all the blessings for themselves. Uh, one way I've heard this put is that uh, Israel, in a sense, was like God's mailmen, such that God would give his law to them, specially, and then they were to take that and to go and be a blessing to all the nations. Uh, but instead of doing that, again, as the mail carriers, they just kept all the letters. They just kept it thinking that it all belongs to me now. Like, God has given all this stuff, now I'm going to keep it all. And that was not what they're supposed to do. And this ultimately was what we see Jonah doing in the book of Jonah, right? He, 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 he loved Israel. This was his nation. He doesn't want ultimately any other things to happen for the other nations because he was so all consumed with his own people. And so ultimately, Jonah was more upset about the loss of his own comfort than the, uh, than the destruction of the people he was literally supposed to be ministering to as an Israelite. And therefore, this is all very relevant to us going back to our application uh, because while that's true of Israel, the amazing thing is the very same mission that Israel had now exists for the church today because the church today is the Israel of God. We're told that in Galatians 6.16. Paul literally calls the church is the Israel of God. Uh, the church is Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3.29. The church is the chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 1 Peter 2.9. Right? The, the New Testament frequently now calls the church the same things that Israel was called. And so just as Israel was called to go be God's means to go bless all the nations, so now that is what the church is called to be. The church has not replaced Israel. The church is Israel. Israel is the church. We are the same. And our mission is the same. And so the church is now to be a city on a hill that shines forth the light of Christ and draws all the nations. That's what Israel is supposed to be. That's what the church is supposed to be. We are the same. And so, therefore, because of that, then specifically for us as a church right here in this region, which is where God has placed us by His providence, that means uh, this particular area, as in north central Minnesota, is the area where we are to then be devoting our efforts to. Right? So, uh, this entire region where we are is our Sodom and Gomorrah, as it were. It is our Nineveh, as it were, where we, like Abraham and like Jonah, are to be interceding on behalf of this region and to be uh, speaking to the people of this region, calling them ultimately to repentance and ministering to them so that they would turn from their wickedness to the living God. That's what we exist as a church to be doing. And, uh, and ultimately, to that end, some just practical things we can be doing as just a small sampling list is actually to continue to do the things, many of the things that we're already doing, but to continue to do them in faith, like what we're doing right now. The Lord's Day worship is absolutely vital to that end. Uh, family worship, right? You worshiping as families at, uh, throughout the week. Evangelism. Singing Christmas carols in the public square and declaring the kingship of Jesus to all who will hear. Uh, gathering as a church to pray, like what we do on the first Wednesday of the month, where we gather and then we pray for various things, often for the community, and interceding because that's what the church's role is for this particular region, to intercede on God's, uh, to God, uh, pleading for His mercy. And then to be going home and praying for this throughout the week. Uh, fellowshipping with one another, showing hospitality to one another, loving our wives, respecting our husbands, raising up our kids to know the Lord, doing excellent work in your vocation, and then repenting whenever you fail in any of these areas. Just, that's not an exhaustive list, but it's just a small sampling of the things we do as a church in faith to then fulfill our calling here to this particular region. And so because of that, in conclusion, uh, in the spirit of how Jonah, the book of Jonah, 
uh, just ends semi-abruptly, perhaps to us, with on, on a question. Just he asks us a question. The end. That's how it closes. Uh, that's what I want to therefore do for us today as we close out the Book of Jonah here, and as we close out our time for this morning. And that is. Uh, just as Jonah proved to be more concerned with his own comforts at this time, being given the shade, than he was about the very mission that God had for him as an Israelite, uh, the question is, what areas in your life do you find that that is going to be true for you? Like, the, the thing to be pondering, like, where are you most tempted to go after comforts uh, as opposed to fulfilling the mission that God has given. And again, just taking that list that I just mentioned a few moments ago. Where are you more tempted to prioritize comforts and leisures and your own thing than you are Sunday worship, family worship, evangelism, singing the praises of God, gathering as a church to pray, fellowshipping with one another, showing hospitality, loving your wife, respecting your husband, raising your kids, doing excellent work. All of these you know, foundational, kingdom-advancing things, where do you find in your life that you are most tempted to put those things aside for the sake of your own comfort? That's a, just kind of a self-examination question that I would encourage you to be asking yourself this week and beyond. Are there any areas where your comfort and convenience trumps God's mission to Christianize this area? Do you find, like Jonah, that you can be more irritated at the loss of your own comforts than the actual plight of this condition in this region and their lost state? Right? So that's what I'm encouraging us to exhort. And if you find that there are certain areas where it's like, it's true, I, I am certainly more concerned with my own comforts and my own thing than I am with the mission of God, then the call, naturally, is to repent of that and to uh, flee back to the Lord for forgiveness. And then praise be to God that when you do, there is genuine forgiveness. Uh, we don't get how the, you know, whatever happens after Jonah, like, concludes here. We don't know what happened to Jonah, but the very fact that we have the book of Jonah implies that Jonah would have written all of this down, or he would have shared all of these details to a close accomplice who then wrote it down. And the very fact that we have Jonah's account and we get him warts and all, you know, it's like some unflattering characteristics, implies that Jonah recognized this about himself, and then he wrote it down himself, or he communicated that to the person who did write it down, and thus that actually does imply that he did go on to repent of his bad attitude on this occasion. And so if that is the case, and Lord, we, we don't know ultimately, but it's a good indication that it is, then let us do likewise. Like Jonah, let us, if we realize, wow, I've been way more consumed with my own stuff than I have been with the very mission of God, then repent. Flee to the Lord in forgiveness, ask Him to help you, and then trust that He will. This is a prayer that God really does delight to answer. So let us think of these things. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we do thank you and we praise you once again for giving us the uh, book of Jonah. We thank you for all that we've been able to learn and glean from it over these last couple of weeks. And we ask uh, for your continued grace to now be with us as we go forward and as we apply all of these things to our lives so that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word only, but that we would also be doers of the word and that you would uh, truly uh, convict our hearts where they need to be convicted and that you would comfort our hearts where they need to be comforted and that you would just simply minister to us uh, personally uh, exactly what we need. Lord, you know the hearts of every single person here and even those who aren't able to be here this morning. You know uh, exactly the, the, the thoughts and the, the lifestyle of, of all of us. And therefore, God, we're asking that you would now mightily, powerfully, in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, minister to us, God. That you, would, that you would transform us ever increasingly and sanctify us ever increasingly so as to be conformed to your word and to be in obedience to your law. And that we would therefore be a pleasing, uh, a pleasing church in your sight that would fulfill the mission that you've called us to do, to Christianize this area and to not be uh, a faithless church or to be a lukewarm church or, or any other kind of a church that would not take your mission seriously. So God, we're asking for these blessings to accompany us. You alone have the power to give these gifts. And so we come now in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. For this morning is that in Acts chapter 10, the Apostle Peter, whose father's name was Jonah, that we learn in Matthew 16, 17, he was in the city of Joppa 
which is the very same city that Jonah went to to sail out of in Jonah chapter 1. And while in Joppa, he received the vision of a sheet coming down from heaven with what had formerly been unclean animals in it. And God commands Peter to eat them because they are now clean. Peter was initially reluctant, but conceded in the end, and later in the chapter, he understands that the unclean animals represented the Gentiles. And so, just as Jonah fled to Joppa to flee his mission of going to the Gentiles, so in the New Covenant, Peter, the son of Jonah, while in Joppa, is commanded to go to the Gentiles. And this all the more highlights that just as Israel was to be a blessing to the world, so the church today is to be God's means of drawing the world to himself. And so, the charge is to go out and to do just that. And, as we do, beware of getting to the point where you simply begin to care more about your own comforts and conveniences than you do about the mission of God. Now, the benediction. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.